Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our series, Mapping the Fraud Blueprint of Tomorrow, brought to you by BDO Australia. My name is Adam Sims. I'm a financial crime solicitor and forensic services partner at BDO. Recently, the AS8001, the Australian Standard 8001, was updated to provide up-to-date guidance on corporate governance relating to fraud and corruption. This webinar series aims to build your understanding and application of the standard through the three T's, tech, transparency, and tone from the top. We are presenting these in a three-part series, continuing with today's session. If you missed our last session on tech, please visit the webinar series link where you'll find a recording to that presentation. Today, we're looking at transparency. It is important to emphasize that these sessions are designed to explore these topics and their application to business. So whilst we do refer to the standard, this is more about providing the context as to the why, and we draw on experts to provide that commentary. Needless to say, if you need more detailed information about your organisation and the circumstances uh, upon the application of the standard, please reach out. Now, before we kick things off, I'd just like to quickly draw your attention to some housekeeping. Start with, you're all automatically muted. Um, we will be accepting questions throughout the session and you can submit these using the question tab. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. However, um, fortunately, time runs out often and uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll follow up after the webinar concludes. Um, we won't let any questions go without following them up. If at any time you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click the support button. And finally, the session is being recorded so all registrants will receive a follow-up email containing a link to the recording and speaker contact details. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel of experts. I'm joined today by Senator Deborah O'Neill, Senator O'Neill is a New South Wales Senator and is presently the Chair of the Privileges Committee in the Federal Parliament. Senator O'Neill also sits on the Education and Employment, Community Affairs, and Corporations and Financial Services Committees. In recent times, Senator O'Neill has taken a keen interest in matters of transparency and earlier this year was instrumental in initiating and is a member of, I believe, the Senate Standard Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs undertaken inquiry and inquiry into Australia's money laundering laws. It's a privilege to have uh, you in our session, Senator, and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm also joined by Lewis Rangot, who is the Executive Director of Corruption Prevention at the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Lewis was a fellow committee member of the Australian Standards Committee, updating AS8001, and he is a trusted authority on all things fraud and corruption prevention related. Lewis started his corruption prevention career at the Commission in 2003, it's a long time ago, um, before holding senior corruption prevention roles in the public and private sectors before being appointed to his present position. Lewis is also a certified fraud examiner and he and I have also shared advisory roles on the New South Wales Corruption Prevention Network. Thanks for joining us today, Lewis. Thanks, Adam. Hello, everybody. Lastly, uh, a warm welcome to Jane Olson. Over more than 15 years, Jane has provided advice to hundreds of whistleblowers, senior executives and integrity professionals on how to make, receive or manage a report of wrongdoing, as well as to governments on appropriate legislation. She's currently a research fellow at the Centre of Governance and Public Policy at Griffith University, where she's also undertaking doctorate studies examining the institutional roles of Australian whistleblowing oversight agencies. Jane was a member of the research team on the Whistle Why They Work 1 and 2 projects and represented Standards Australia on the ISO 37002 working group. In her substantive role, Jane leads the public interest disclosures research and policy functions of the New South Wales Ombudsman. We're excited to have you with us today, Jane. Yeah, great to be here, Adam. So, um, in the revision of the updating and updating, sorry, of the uh, of AS 8001, the committee was often drawn to the concept of transparency as a fundamental theme to changes to the changes that we were making in the update. In our last webinar, as I as I said, we explored technology cybercrime as a reasonably new threat. However, transparency was a little different. It's not a new concept, but it was very clear in the committee's research that this was no longer an option. It's now a must. And so the changes you will um, now read in the new standard uh, will, will demonstrate that. 
Organisations across the private and public sectors need to be mindful that we live in an age of transparency. If you are covering something up or doing something wrong, I think we all agree there is a high degree of probability that it will become known to the world at large at some point. You only have to look at the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, the FinCEN file leak, um, and most recently we, we now have the Pandora Papers uh, exposing corrupt or criminal behaviours of world leaders and the powerful and influential to understand this. Add that to the fact that we now live at a time where trust and security is often absent. And in the absence of these, pressures come into play. COVID-19 has certainly further muddied the water in that pond. In the last two years, uh, I know from our perspective, we've seen an increase in fraud, we've seen an increase in corrupt behaviour and other misconduct, not only in private business, but also in government. Such is the prevalent of this absence of trust and security and disturbing increase, and what, what I would call actually a disturbing increase in untruthful behaviour that, um, and here's a bit of trivia for you, fake news is Macquarie Dictionary's word of the decade. Incidentally, anyone who is interested in the topic, um, I'd recommend you have a look at the 2021 Edelman, that's E-D-E-L-M-A-N, Trust Barometer. Um, it's an extremely interesting read. The upshot is in business that we need to rely on mechanisms to uncover and detect this activity if, it if it's happening in our organisation. To that end, we'll drill down on two important focus areas from AS8001 for today's discussion of transparency. They are whistleblowing, as you see on the screen there, and also business relationships. So let's start with whistleblowing. Um, some of you may have heard of a company called Theranos. Theranos developed medical techni technology that was being, um, sorry, that was going to revolutionise, revolutionise medical industry. Theranos was fudging the testing uh, on the machine they developed uh, as it didn't work. It was a, it was basically technologically impossible, the current medical technology. The founder and CEO, Elizabeth Holmes, was uh, charismatic, described as charismatic, and it is alleged she even adopted a male tone voice to trick others into believing her. She swindled millions from sophisticated investors like Rupert Murdoch and installed and controlled, I might add, the Theranos board, which was made up of some um, of some US or top US officials. Presumably that was so that uh, the, the company would be more believable. Uh, at worst, the machine was actually leading to misdiagnosis of serious in illnesses. Erica Chang, the lady at the bottom under under Elizabeth Holmes, was a lab technician who started noticing discrepancies in the tests being run at the laboratory. She approached the COO who dismissed her and told her she was wrong to go away and do what she's being paid to do. She was so concerned that she then approached a board member. Now remember, that must have been uh, a feat in bravery given that they were top US officials or ex-top US officials. He also dismissed her and told her that she shouldn't be working there as there were very smart people running the company. She was forced out of her dream job with a lot of doubt, anxiety, before deciding to blow the whistle to the New York Times. Um, that unfortunately resulted in threats from the company. She was followed by private investigators and uh, countless threats of legal action. She was then advised by a lawyer to report Theranos to a regulator. And by her own account, it took her four weeks sitting in front of a computer with the letter for she um, she was consumed with self-doubt um, she you know and that was spawned by I guess the conduct of the company um, and and two the other factors that were on her mind were you know did I get this right um, is this going to be made public am I going to be humiliated publicly given the the conduct of the company um, she eventually made the disclosure and ultimately Theranos was shut down CEO COO both charged and and presently before the courts in the US um, the second uh, example there is Wirecard. So Pav Gill is, is the guy at the bottom there in the middle. He's the whistleblower for Wavcard, uh, sorry, Wirecard. Um, he was a lawyer at Wirecard and not long after starting in 2017, he was approached by a number of employees about an alleged wide scale cooking of the books. Now, imagine being a, a legal officer in a new role and then suddenly getting a uh, whistleblower come forward with that. So he investigated. He quickly identified the main suspect, 
who seemed to be a protected company financial officer, despite not having much experience, which he thought was odd. He diligently engaged an external law firm, thought this was a bit bigger than what he could handle, and a forensic investigation followed, resulting in seizure of emails, implicating widespread corruption in the company, all the way to the top. Now, he was heading up the investigation. He thought this would be great news. The board would be happy to hear this. Um, except he was given the astounding choice by the CEO to resign with a positive reference or be fired. Now, being a smart cookie lawyer, he took a copy of the incriminating data and subsequently resigned. He too was stalked by private investigators employed by the company. He was harassed. He couldn't get a job due to bad references, which was odd. He'd never had that before in his life. And a smear campaign by the company um, was identified. So he decided to turn whistleblower, use the information that he had. He continued to be discredited by the company um, until the arrest of the CEO, um, who was subsequently arrested. And the COO on that occasion, I believe, is still missing. He's disappeared. Um, but the uh, moral of the story is the experience almost destroyed his life. Um, he's moved on, but he still suffers from anxiety and what could be described as post-traumatic stress. Uh, Jane, I understand you've got some uh, experience with the, the ATO matter. Did you want to talk about that one, given its Australian context? <clears throat> Are you there, Jane? Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, got you. Yeah, great. Sorry about that. Uh, so Robert, the gentleman in the corner, in the right-hand corner there, he was in a compliance and enforcement role at the ATO, Australian Taxation Office, and he was involved in, I suppose, um, recovering debts from small business owners um, in relation to their tax. And he became quite concerned about a culture of, of what might be described as overzealous um, enforcement and through the use of Ghana's she orders. So whereby the tax office would, would directly, as a first, I guess, debt recovery process, um, go to banks and direct them to recover the debt from the small business account. Um, now, this previously hadn't been, I guess, the process that was used, and he was concerned that it was not providing procedural fairness to small businesses. <laughs> So he reported it internally to the ATO, as I think a lot of whistleblowers try to do first, is to do the right thing and, and report internally. Um, the ATO did undertake some inquiries, but that investigation uh, has since been described by the Commonwealth Ombudsman in a parliamentary inquiry as a superficial investigation into his business, and they didn't really follow up with any action taken. So he then, uh, again, gathered lots of documents. Uh, he was a good investigator and he went to the media with his concerns. As soon as he did that, he he was charged um, and is now facing, it's been lowered, I think it was about 60 cases, but it's now 24 counts of disclosing official information. And this is four years later, he's still facing that prosecution. Uh, and I think one thing to remember is that his revelations ended up did being investigated by the Inspector General of Taxation here. Um, and it actually found to be vindicated that these concerns were real and there has been a number of policy reforms resulting uh, since his, his disclosures. Mm. And what's the status with the charges? Were they? I, I believe they were being withdrawn at one point. Uh, the government was considering, or the DPP, um, Commonwealth, was considering withdrawing them, uh, but decided to proceed in April this year. So that's the latest. Um, it's still pre-trial, essentially. Mm. Um, Senator O'Neill, I, I read an AFR quote, um, I think it was from 2019, where you said, whistleblowing is, very important part, is a very important part of a healthy democracy and is crucial to getting the truth of what's going on. And then I also read, I think it was late last year in a German speech that you gave, which painted a, a, a really disturbing picture concerning whistleblower oppression. What are you seeing from a government level? What's, what's the concerns that are, that, are, that are coming on your radar? Well, look, thank you for the opportunity to participate, Adam. Um, I, I do have grave concerns. I, I want to take the opportunity to just use the example of the ATO whistleblower to um, apprise your 
um, participants today of what privilege means when somebody comes to a parlamentarian because it's the ultimate form of whistleblowing. Um, and it, it's vital that we are able to actually receive information from people. And if that um, gentleman who had whistleblown in good faith within his organisation to the ATO had, fit, had met a, a much more transparent and appropriate culture, he wouldn't be in the situation that he's in. But given the cultural practices, and I'm very glad that you're going to say, you know, the tone from the top matters in your next seminar, um, the cultural practices of the government, and we see it, I am a Labor senator, so you need to filter this with your own, um, you know, your own uh, learning knowledge and thoughts. It, the suppression of information is at a level in the government uh, that's really problematic for us as senators. So um, we do still have privilege though. So if that gentleman had come to me, uh, and given me the information, I am able to put that in the public place with his identity protected or her identity as it may be. And then that becomes part of the public conversation. And whistleblowers have come to me many times over the years. I remember when I was first in the parliament as a member for Robertson, um, Mr. Morris came to me, Jeff Morris from CBA, and we know how difficult his journey was. And to have met him over those years and seen the personal toll is just enormous. Um, you referred, Adam, to a speech that I gave that I called um, the AMP Annie speech. That is not the person's name, but I had a series of interactions with Annie and conversations with her, and she talked about the whole process. It was a speech on the evening of Tuesday, the 25th of August, 2020. If anybody wants to read it, it is her story, pretty much exactly as she gave it to me. Raised formal complaints within the company, then external legal representatives, um, and basically she was advised, and this is what she told me, they told me that organisations often take their chances knowing that women will be unwilling to risk ruining their lives, unable to afford hundreds of thousands of dollars on legal fees, and I had no choice but to seek internal resolution. She talks about being in a lift on the day that she departs, and then she talks about incredible experience of harassment by people who harassed her and then continued their successful careers. Um, interestingly, after I gave that speech, the next morning, um, government relations from AMP rang me saying, please give me Annie's details so we can fix the problem, which is another form of invasion. So there's a whole failure of processes at every level about the way that we deal with whistleblowing. Um, mm -hmm. And sadly, I think it's hit a point where people are being damaged in the workplace when they raise a concern. There are long-term mental health in, uh, implications. And for many businesses, they've just seen that as the cost of doing business, whether it's a public uh, entity or a private entity. The cost of doing business, well, look, we play it hard around here. That's how you, that's the, the culture. Um, you know, and if we lose a few along the way and do a bit of damage, well, you know, that's the cost of doing business. That is the reality that's confronting whistleblowers. And it's just not good enough. Just not good enough. Yeah, that, that's extremely disturbing. Um, Jane, I'm interested in your views on this. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of change at the moment in the laws. We're, we're seeing change with with uh, standards such as uh, 8001 and then the new ISO. Well, I guess you, you guys are at the forefront of the research on this. Well, what's that telling you about the effectiveness of um, whistleblowing and, and and maybe if there's any view you have on the laws that are, that are, are now in action um, to protect whistleblowers? Sure. Um, I guess, well, first of all, on the importance of whistleblowing, one thing I, I strongly advocated for in the discussions on the new fraud and corruption control standard was that when we're talking about detecting fraud, that having a strong whistleblower management system should be number one. It should be the first thing you do. Mm -hmm. Because we know it is the most effective way in which wrongdoing comes to light in organisations. And we know this from a few different sources. So first of all, if we ask organisations, and there's lots of surveys that are undertaken um, that ask about the most serious fraud that was uncovered uh, and how, how it was, you know, um, details about it, about the perpetrators and whatnot. And consistently what these studies show is that tips, um, knowledge from insiders are the number one way in which serious fraud gets detected. Uh, what we've done at, at Griffith Uni is for since 2007, we started asking managers and governance professionals, so people who are in the know, who know how things come about in their organisation, what do you think is the most important way of bringing wrongdoing to light? And we asked them about internal audit, routine controls, observation by management, and 
since then, and it's actually increased over rated as the most important. And I think this shows that there is a move towards, even though I, I completely agree um, with the Senator that, that there's still a long way to go, but I have seen moves um, definitely in the corporate sector in recent times towards treating, uh, I guess, whistleblower reports more as business intelligence and seeing them as part of a risk management framework. And if I look at the organisations that I think are performing strongly in, in this area, that's how they're treating this issue. Um, are the laws enough? Well, uh, I think the fact that we've not had one whistleblower um, in Australia be successfully compensated under any of our legislation um, shows that there's still some work to be done there. Uh, so I, I think that the ASIC, um, and the Corporations Act, it was it was a new change. So I think it's too early to say um, exactly how that will work. But I, I think laws are not enough as well, would be the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, my view's always been to, to clients, um, the opportunity to have a whistleblowing mechanism is even if you're not required to have it by law, it, it you know, it's just a good barometer on the business. If something's Absolutely. going wrong, there, there's always gonna be an avenue for someone to alert you as to what's happening. Okay, um, let's let's go on to the law now. Um, at BDO, we actually run a whistleblowing hotline service, and um, in speaking with clients, prospective clients, and and actual whistleblowers who who call into the service, there are common concerns that exist in relation to whistleblowing, and you'll see them on your screen there. Um, if we look at the business concerns firstly, because I know we, we, we do focus on the whistleblower rightly, but there, also, there are also concerns from the business. Um, we have the Corporations Act, and, and as we've mentioned, we've got various state um, public interest disclosure acts. Now we've got AS8001, we've got ISO 37002. I mean, you know, is it all too confusing for business? And, and given the, the last dot point there, they, they, one of the concerns is over regulatory scrutiny if too many disclosures are made or they get the law wrong. Um, I'm interested in anyone's view on that. I, I would say, Adam, Adam um, you go, Lewis. Oh, I was just gonna say, Adam, the, um, the situation we have in, in my organisation, the ICAC, we have mandatory reporting of suspected misconduct. So if something's going wrong and you don't report it, you've potentially broken the law by failing to report it to us as a public sector agency. And I think that's mm. the situation I think that the Senator was describing in the, in the corporate world. Um, it's um, you don't necessarily have that mandatory reporting. And so this desire to keep it in-house and keep, keep dirty laundry um, out of the press and away from people like the Senator herself. And so I think a lot of people's gut reaction is to treat it as a, uh, a whistleblowing event, as a thing that needs to be concealed and kept inside the four walls of their organisation. And you can sort of accept that, you can sort of understand that, but it's still not an excuse to um, completely ignore it and not treat it as a piece of an opportunity to make the business run a bit better. Um, and I think that's unfortunately that, that um, gut reaction is to, to defend it rather than treat it as an opportunity to improve things that creates problems. Mm. Uh, can I, Jane, I have to agree um, yes. because I, I wonder how many KPI measurements for senior executives include an increase in whistleblowing within the organisation as a measure of success. Um, that, that is the, that, that, when that happens, we will have seen the cultural shift that is necessary to occur. The cost of doing business should not be the cover up of corrupt uh, and disabling behaviours that don't meet uh, community uh, and business standards. And, and the reality is um, I have grave concerns about the regulators even um, their capacity. I'm, I'm pleased to read ASIC's communication, but I'm mindful of um, questions that I've asked in recent oversight uh, hearings of ASIC with regard to the Newix float, which I'm sure that you're all familiar with. Um, and there was a whistleblower who tried to keep their identity quiet and has been successful so far that pushed uh, information, uh, very, very high quality information through a legal representative to um, ASIC um, and I have grave concerns about the timeliness of the way in which that was responded to, although I have sensed a change in attitude in ASIC over the time that I've been um, overseeing that, uh, th their work through that committee. The cultural change 
um, is being verbaled. I don't know that it's being enacted and uh, the systems that prevail are very resistant to that change to you know celebration of this is something that's a risk for our, our, our business we should identify it immediately and respond that's not seen as a positive outcome yet I do hope that that will happen um, but there will need to be some financial rewards to push very resistant cultures that have been established over decades and I think that's the case in the US isn't it where yeah. there is financial reward um, you stole my thunder about ASIC. Uh, I was going to ask about Sorry. the. About, no, no, that's good. That's good. You're reading my mind. Um, so ASIC, for you, for all that don't know on the call, is the private sector whistleblowing regulator. Um, it has a about three or four, I think, reg, uh, regulatory guidances in relation to whistleblowing, um, and and the one important one is is RG. 270, Regulatory Guidance 270, which talks about the whistleblowing policy, which is what is mandated under the Corporations Act. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with that, you'll see on the right there just some dot points around what are the requirements uh, under the Act and what are the requirements to go into a whistleblowing policy. Um, there are more, but they're the important ones. Um, I understand that ASIC recently wrote to CEOs after it did a 12 month audit of adherence to the new legislation. Um, Jane, did you want to comment on what the letter was that went out to the, the CEOs and, and what it contained? Where, where were the failings that, that ASIC uh, or that ASIC observed in, in policies that exist after 12 months? Yeah, sure. so um, I guess what ASIC did was really conduct a desktop audit um, of policies. So I guess one thing to remember with, with this type of audit is that it's the first stage often. I mean, it's essential after a new, I, I guess, provision such as this, that the first thing is to have a policy in place, to have it consistent with the law. Um, so I think it's from an oversight point of view, it's a good first step, but it's only a first step because it's only reviewing what's on paper rather than what's happening in practice. On paper, what it found is that a lot of companies, I guess, either updated fully their whistleblower policy, um, given the, the the changes to the whistleblower provisions that were made and and they really as it really pushed push CEOs and um, to do that and to ensure they did. Um, some of the key things were for example there was a requirement previously that concerns be made in good faith. Uh, now that's an inherently difficult legal term and it can often uh, call the whistleblower's motive into question when often what's more important is what they are disclosing. Um, and so that was removed, but the, the ASIC review found that a lot of policies still relied on some element of looking at the whistleblower's motive and whatnot. Um, there's also now quite, quite positive um, obligations on organisations to proactively provide support and protection to whistleblowers. And often the practical mechanisms of, of how that was going to happen uh, simply wasn't contained in policy. So that, I guess, those reassuring, encouraging um, what you need to people to get them to come forward, in many cases simply wasn't there. As long, and along with, I guess, different legal technicalities um, of the provisions being misunderstood. Yeah, I must say a lot of the questions we get when we are speaking to whistleblowers is about the process. So what's going to happen to their complaint? How is it going to be investigated? How can they get some, um, you know, confidence that it will be treated seriously? Uh, or, or in fact, um, I remember speaking to one recently who said, I'm concerned that if it's not investigated properly, this is just an allegation. It might not, you know, someone might lose their job and I'm responsible for that. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's, there's real questions around how it's implemented and we'll talk about that next. So um, I guess we're seeing a big pendulum swing back to, or to, not back, to the private sector. What about weaknesses within the public sector? It's always been seen as the strong, um, it's always seen to be strong with whistleblowing. Uh, what are the weaknesses that we're seeing, um, whether it be state or federal or both? From my point of view, I guess at a federal level, for a start, there's been um, there was a review undertaken by Philip Moss uh, over five years ago now, and the government has committed to enacting those legislations, and we're we're yet to see any bill 
um, about that. So I think that's an absolutely priority to ensure that we get a better Commonwealth pit out in place. Um, at the state, at the state level, uh, things are progressing. So we will see talk about this in, in more detail, but even last week we had a new PID bill introduced in New South Wales Parliament. Um, and, and I think the states, in the absence of the Commonwealth level, are continuing to look at innovation in public interest disclosure law and whistleblower protection. And, and in many ways they're coming up with new ways or, and extending protections um, that is not happening elsewhere. Lewis, any observations from the, you know, what the ICAC is is seeing from its uh, debrief and investigations? Yeah, I think one thing we've noticed is if if a public servant in New South Wales makes a disclosure and it goes to a, you know, experienced complaint handler, someone in the, the legal department of their agency, it, it generally is managed okay. There's, cert there's certainly always some um, difficulties, but it's okay and, and probably slowly getting better. I think one thing a thing we have seen is though increasingly government business and government services are delivered by the private sector, which you, you, you know your um, guests might have views on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But um, a really good example is um, ageing and disability services were always in the, in the past delivered by New South Wales public servants. Now they're delivered through the NDIS and and um, sort of outsourced services, and that that might be efficient and fine. But you don't have a good complaint, an experienced complaint handler working inside an agency that does that work. And so um, it's got, it's taxpayers' money. It's really public services, but it's been delivered through the bank account of a private, I suppose, a private sector organisation, and they tend to um, not want to not want to report bad news to their their government clients and don't have experienced complaint handlers. And so big chunk chunks of public service are, are being delivered that way and that's where we've seen some some weaknesses I, I suppose in the way public money is spent. Mm. Mm. Um, in addition to the um, MOSS review, uh, this report uh, is yet another one that's been provided to the government as really a blueprint for legislative action and, uh, and, and further action with regard to whistleblowing. It's entitled Whistleblower Protections. Um, and can I tell you, um, while we have robust debates and sometimes we really divide, in the Senate we really try to create as best as we can reports that provide the government whatever flavour, a path forward. And this was one of those where we worked so hard to deliver a unanimous report. Um, 2017, September 2017, and a lot of water's gone under the bridge and I dare say a lot of disclosures that should and could have been made with a better regime that would not only have improved the life outcomes for those people who were whistleblowing, but very likely improved the outcomes for the private businesses and the public entities. Um, all those opportunities have just disappeared in the course of the last four years since this was delivered. Um, in terms of the public-private divide, interestingly, particularly in light of Lewis's comments, one of the um, points of difference that was noted in the opening remarks to the report was that Labor and Greens um, senators on the committee actually suggested that a single act should proceed because where whistleblowing needs to occur, whether it's in the public or the private sector, um, it, it's for all Australians. Um, and I think that we're, you know, a country of, uh, a, with a democratic, you know, a rich um, pluralistic democracy, social democracy, um, whether you work in the private sector or the public sector, I think it's fair to expect that you should have the same degree of safe work conditions, including when you seek to whistleblow in the interest of your fellow workers, in the interest of the company, in the interest of probity and accountability to the broader public, because business and the, private, the public sector uh, really are servants of the public. You don't operate a business with no social connection to the entire community. And we've seen that in the health realities that we've all confronted. You know, um, COVID didn't worry about the public-private boundary. Mm. I don't think uh, corruption worries about the public and private boundary. Uh, and the recommendations about uh, considering a reward scheme and structure are embedded in this report as well. And none of that has really been lifted by the government in the four years since this report was delivered. And can I just strongly reiterate all, all that the Senator just said then? I think, and what's really important, um, picking up on, on what a single piece of legislation would do, is that it does embed it in that work-right relationship. 
So an employer has a duty of care to its staff anyway to ensure a safe and supportive environment, and that includes when someone has just got a wrongdoing. So putting whistleblower protection within um, you know, your usual workplace industrial relations, it, it makes sense and to do that across the board. Um, the UK has legislation like that and it has its own flaws, um, but it provides a model that I think would streamline uh, regulation in Australia. I uh, totally agree. And uh, it's nice to know that debate's occurring. Perhaps it should be happening a bit faster, but I guess we're moving in the right direction. But at the end of the day, and this is a segue into our next slide, um, it, you know, having something written is, is, is one thing, but if it's not implemented correctly, um, and as we've seen in the examples mentioned, avenues can be put in place to facilitate whistleblowing and, mis and misconduct. Uh, but in doing so, it seems sometimes the interest is really just about checking that regulatory box. Um, you know, the rubber really hits the road in the implementation. It, would, would you agree with that? Yes, I absolutely would. I think it's one thing having, a pol like I mentioned earlier, a policy in place. Um, and it's one thing dealing with these really complex matters that involve people and involve people in a workplace. Um, so this, this flow chart here actually is from the international standard on whistleblowing management systems that has recently been released in June. And we were able to input a lot of some of our research um, into this. This section talks about how you deal with the report once it's made. So it's really focused on that operational process, going through from receiving a report, how to set up trustworthy channels, um, and, and but one thing where I think this this standard really makes some innovation is in looking at that assessment. Um, so basically, what you can see here is that we recommend that when a report is made, you triage the wrongdoing elements and determine what what reports and concerns are being dealt with. But at the same time, you assess the risk to the whistleblower. And it may be that depending on what those risks are, you deal with it in a different way and whatnot. And some of our research found, for example, that when an organisation actually sits down with a whistleblower as soon as they've made a report and thinks through what can go wrong, what are the risks this person faces, uh, that reporter actually uh, faces half as much repercussions as they might otherwise would and are more than twice as likely to say their organisation treated them well. So it's just really important that that's done right up front, I think. Yeah. The, the ISO, it, it applies to all business, right? Not just, it's not deciphering between private or public. It's across the board. No, it's in, absolutely. It's intended to apply to any organisation, small, medium or large. Um, obviously, how you're on, on your setup and what your industry is, what your risks are. But it's there to provide a process that anyone can pick up. Um, it includes things from policy, management, commitment, training, all those, I guess, system elements, as well um, as I've mentioned, this operational process and how you continually improve and evaluate those functions too. Excellent. And that was just recently released, I understand. Yeah, so it was released in June, I believe, um, at the international level. Um, now what we're doing, I suppose, is uh, uh, quite a lot of need from organisations out there. That they've been asking us, when will there be an Australian standard in whistleblowing? So there was one previously, but it's since been withdrawn. Um, so as part of the Australian Standards Committee, um, what we'll be doing is looking at implementing or adopting that international standard in Australia. So that will go out for due consultation um, through the typical standards process in due course. And, and Lewis, thank you. Uh, and, and Lewis, if I remember uh, our discussions on the committee also, there was the discussion around the expectation that this ISO would be released. Um, we, we, however, decided to include the whistleblowing components in, in 8001 um, as, as an interim measure. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So and it, it, it really just reflects the discussion we've been having this morning. It, it talks about when you boil it right down, it's just treating people decently. With it. So having a policy, mm. you know, treat the case on its merits, treat people decently. It's kind of that in a, in a bit of legalese. So you, so you can sort of um, overcomplicate these these things um, at, at some levels. But I think what Jane said earlier is is definitely correct in our experience. So we can we can 
in, at my organisation, we can sort of dig around in people's bank accounts and we can follow them around and we can listen to their phone calls. But none of that happens unless we get someone coming forward with a enough of a case to, to warrant some sort of a preliminary investigation. So if we didn't have whistleblowers coming forward, a lot of the, the, the ICAC cases that you see in the press just would never get off the ground. They're our most important source of information. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. All right, now we'll now move to uh, focus area two, as I as I explained when we started. So we'll be looking at business relationships. Now, a, a point of uh, a point of note here is that whistleblowing laws and protections extend to business associates also. And this, I am thinking, um, it's safe to say, Lewis, can be a vital transparency tool in the procurement policy. Uh, sorry, procurement po process. Yeah, that's right. So. Um, you sort of think about a typical agency or firm, it's got a network of people it does business with and that includes its customers, its suppliers, uh, I think Senator O'Neill talked about um, you know, social responsibilities it might have, really anything where there's either a, a formal business relationship, you could even extend it to sort of a, you know, these, these social touch points that you have with, with your community. You want those people to be able to blow the whistle as well, but also if you're doing business with them, and I think the this is an area where the private sector does things better than the public sector. So the banks, for instance, are now well versed in you know know your customer requirements and you know how to properly onboard a customer to make you know make sure they're not doing money laundering, for instance. But the public sector is, I think, behind in this area. So if you, if you sort of think about a public sector tender you know, you, you require your tender is to provide certain, certain information, but where we find a lot of our uh, corrupt conduct at the ICAC, it's where a government entity can uh, allows a, a supplier onto the vendor master, fo master file. There's no due diligence, it's all just too easy. And they, they suddenly find that they've, you know, handed over, you know, a six or seven figure volume amount of taxpayers' money to an organisation that's that's a front for something else or it's owned by a staff member or it's owned by the spouse of a, a staff member or, or even that the, the work was never done. So it's pretty basic procurement frauds that would all be resolved just by doing some better due diligence up front about who, you, who you're doing business with. And so I think it's an area where there, um, um, lots of organisations can devote a bit of attention if they're worried about fraud and corruption. Yeah, we're certainly seeing a, an uptick in, in due diligence work. I mean, we'll get in and, and uh, do due diligence for clients to understand uh, potential vendors or, or other parties they're about to do business with. Um, the, the one thing I will say is that the ASIC database is probably one of the most expensive in the world to access. And, and then even once you pay for the data, you'll still be in the dark often. And whether a director or a nominee you know whether they're a non non beneficially only uh, holding shares or or whether um, you know the, there's other elements to to their background. Um, it, it just seems there's an ability even in the current system for the, an astonishing level of a non anonymity. So with that in mind, is it still reasonable for the standard to request due diligence on business associates? It is. I think it is. You're right. Um, I think there's a. I might actually. Maybe I'll telephone the senator O'Neill after this and ask for her opinion. But I think. I think there is a case for some of the information in ASIC to be uh, more freely available. But again, you have to do it on a risk basis. So if you're if you're mm. engaging someone to be your stationary supplier, it's not such a big deal. But if they're sort of delivering services on your behalf for you, it's it's worth spending the money on getting a proper DD worked up. And I think. Um, you know, you, you just have to sort of take a, a, a risk approach to which which of those business partners or business associates are the ones that are, you know, that could they do real damage to your brand as a as a business person? That's the, the test, I suppose. Yeah, um, Senator, has always been an issue with trusts, uh, and I know there's been discussion around a, a trust register. Um, where where are we up? Where are we up to with that? Do you know? Well, I, I think we are where we might be with the ASIC register. Um, <laughs> company. <laughs> yeah, there's some, some issues there. I mean, there's been efforts to even sell that off and, and make it private over the years and, and that would make it even more expensive and more difficult to access. Um, we have to accept the fact that there's a lot of power uh, where there's a lot of money and people seek to exert influence and make sure that the way that they've got things set up at the moment, thank you very much, shouldn't be disturbed. Um, and I think it's uh, an abuse of the term privacy 
uh, to be able to find, carve yourself out with enough money, a place in which you can hide uh, and not contribute to the public good through the services that you provide, through the jobs that you create, through the taxes that you pay, through um, you know goodwill in, in, in the community. So sadly, trusts have become uh, a very powerful record for people to provide that uh, hiding place. I'm sure that they actually have a wonderfully uh, useful um, and should, um, capacity to be part of a, of a construction of people's wealth management, but it shouldn't be uh, allowed to continue to be one where uh, things are hidden. And I think we've seen with the Pandora Papers release just how much wealth can create spaces for it um, to sidestep social participation in the economies that it relies on to create its own wealth. So that's sort of an ethical question. And I guess it depends on where you, you stand. And, and like I said before, some businesses will go, well, that's just the cost of doing business. Some wealthy people say, well, that's just the cost of, you know, you being poor and being rich. Um, yeah. I don't think that it's a healthy situation for us to be in. I mean, what would it, what would it be if, you know, that little list you've got there on AS8001 was something that every business had to provide to another business before they could do business? rather than, you know, if you'd like to do business with me, go and do due diligence and check. Um, you know, is this a sort of the document that people would just have, you know, this is who I am, it's provided and it'd be an easy checking point. Um, that way it's like a partnership rather than a, another cost burden for business, because that's how it'll be described. I've got no doubt that it'll be described as more red tape. Um, and, and there is, I come from a small business family background, and there is a sense of having, and my dad, you know, built roads, um, had a very low level of education and my brothers run businesses in that area and my, my daughter's working. So, so small business is important. Yes, it will be seen as red tape, uh, but it's critical that, you know, the protections that are needed for the business are able to be easily accessed. And it's, it's not that they don't want to do the right thing so much of the time. It's just that it's so sticky to get what you need. Um, mm. And so uncertain about where you might find the truth in this, you know, fake news world. Indeed. Um, and I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you. The Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, is this partly the transparency issue driving the review of the adequacies and efficacy of the Australian any, any money laundering and counterterrorism financing um, program as it exists? Which, of course, you know, we're talking about fraud and corruption here. It impacts it directly, right? Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, we've just seen this extraordinary release of millions of previously, you know, secret mm. documents in Pandora Papers. And, and it reminds us of the reality that the government has not chosen to advance what they declared many years ago as a necessary set of legis legislative instruments that needed to be delivered in tranche to um, to provide transparency around money laundering and counter-terrorism finance. Now, all of us are affected and our brothers and sisters across the globe are affected by how money moves. We're part of a global economy. Other nations have taken their responsibility in terms of anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorism finance very seriously and they've uploaded um, their capacity across industries to make sure that that's not going on. We've got a really thin protection line. The banks are doing all the heavy lifting and, and you know, they, they've certainly failed on quite a number of occasions and many of your participants would be aware of the exploitation of children through um, pornography, uh, mm -hmm. through um, the facilitation by Westpac because they didn't actually have proper processes to be watching what was going on with those money transfers. So these are not victimless crimes and it's not just about other places. And it, it concerns me that, and again, it goes to you, you, your next session, um, the leadership from the top, the tone from the top. Is Australia a good international citizen? Uh, can we look around at Canada and Britain and other, uh, other uh, economies and say, well, they're doing their bit to make sure that um, money is not being laundered around the world. Um, sadly, Australia is at a point where now, like we're, we're a bit of a honeypot, frankly, and, and I don't know a single Australian who I've met in my entire time in public office who wants to be a honeypot for, anti, for, for money laundering or for facilitating terrorism finance. We don't want to be that country. 
uh, failure to act, failure to bring in lawyers, failure to bring in property transfer through the real estate industry, leaves us very, very exposed. And again, it speaks to cultural practices and the power of those who already have power in resisting change. I think we, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if, it, if it, Australia and the US are the only countries that haven't um, imposed the FATF recommendations, is that correct? Yeah, it is. So we're, we're at, at the wrong end of the queue. We're at the wrong end of the queue. So I think it's very important that we advance this inquiry. And I know that there is and will be resistance. And again, it'll be the, you know, too much red tape, the cost of doing business is, yes. Um, any change takes at the very least time and perhaps a reassessment of your structures. And for some of us, you know, in particular situations, a reevaluation of the values that we've just accepted, you know, forever. So at the very least, there is this emotional cost to people to think about doing things differently. And then the cost of actually making a transfer of processes, uh, embedding different changes, as we talked about earlier, that, that is another cost of time and money. But if you're going to be a participant in the global economy, and we all want to and have to be part of that, we don't need to be recalcitrants who don't take our responsibility properly. We need to be uh, leading corporate citizens and a leading uh, healthy democracy across the world that protects against money laundering and the damage that it does in communities and protect against terrorism financing that is just, you know, such a threat to the way of life of all humans across the planet. Absolutely. I'll, I'll be watching the, um, the results of that with very keen eyes. Uh, I've been talking about it for some time now and the, the indifference with the laws has, has always been a little bit, I've been curious as to why, but um, thank you for that. Too, too slow, too slow on tranche two, way too slow. Absolutely. I think I was in 2017, uh, I think it was, um, ashamedly, I will say, I was presenting and I promised to the crowd I was presenting to that it's coming this year. And here we are in 2021, not a scaric, anyway. Um, what I'd like, we're just, we, we're coming tight on time now. Uh, I'd just like to focus on what's on the horizon. Now, the, the Crimes Legislation Amendment Combating Corporate Crime Bill 2019. Um, Lewis, do you want to talk about that? This is one that's been around for a little while as well. It's, a, mm. it's I suppose it's, I mean, foreign bribe is already a crime in Australia, but this was essentially adopts what's something that's close to the UK Bribery Act arrangements. So if an Australian organisation or its staff or its business associates bribes a foreign official, they'll, um, not only would they have committed a crime, but the organisation could have also committed a separate crime of failing to prevent that, that bribery. And your defence against that will be if you've got these adequate procedures. And they, there's a draft out there and they kind of approximate the British ones. So, um, you know, directors of, of companies who have got overseas customers, um, that will be their defence. Um, and if, if not, they are, they are potentially personally liable and their company's liable. So that's an interesting development, but uh, it's not law yet. So I think the plan was to try and get it done in this parliament, but um, perhaps the Senate is the best person to speculate when the next election might be, but if it doesn't get done before the election, the bill will lapse and we'll have to try again. So um, there's another asterisk next next to that one, I'm afraid. I heard we were close and I heard it was pretty much a done deal. Um, and, and I guess the viewers will be interested to know what adequate procedures are. And I think looking at the, the government guidance, uh, as you say, they've replicated or, or used the UK model to a large extent. Um, they're, they're talking, what we're talking about there is a company having in place things like a proper risk assessment, corruption risk assessment, which, you know, if you're adhering to AS 8001, you should already have anyway. Um, you know, culture, man man management, tone from the top, um, due diligence again comes up in, in these adequate procedures. You've got communication and training, um, confidentiality around reporting and investigation channels as to how, um, you know, matters will be investigated and then monitoring and review uh, are some of the items in the guidance if you're interested. It's all online. Commonwealth um, has, has issued a, a quite an impressive guidance, I've got to say. Um, what about a federal anti-corruption body, Senator? 
any closer to that? It's been talked about for a long time. Um, if we change the government, yes. Um, it's certainly Labor's policy. Um, I know you might have seen it's over a thousand days since Mr Morrison committed to establishing, now I'm just going to put the term correctly, I think he described it a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Um, so December 2018 that announcement was made uh, but you know the announcement doesn't necessarily mean that the job gets done um, and it's just been delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, if Labor's uh, elected, we, we have already declared that we actually will establish a national anti-corruption um, commission. Um, it'll be independent, it'll have resources um, and the power of the standing rural commission and um, I would have a broad jurisdiction to operate, um, carry out those functions very independently. And we propose that it would be overseen by a statutory bipartisan joint standing committee of the parliament um, empowered to require the commission to provide information about its work. So that, it, that, it, that there's a sort of a cycle, a virtuous cycle if you want to make sure that uh, findings are implemented and that that, that is oversighted. Um, power to hold public hearings, power to make findings of fact. Um, the issue of procedural fairness I think is one that's at the heart of what a federal anti-corruption body might look like and, and that is the thing that everybody struggles with because it's right back to what we're saying in the whistleblower like the protection of an individual who wants to report something of significance that would be of relevance to a federal anti-corruption body um, is, is still something about which people are very, very concerned. People don't think they're going to get the protection that they need, and when they yeah. don't, they end up, you know, with the sort of they send, end up the kind of PTSD situation that uh, Jane acknowledged, I think, earlier, and um, that I indicated about AMP Annie, Annie, you know, who 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 lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, had to leave an industry for which she was, you know, highly highly prepared and highly educated, re-educate herself. Um, the damage to people is real and, and that bridge between uh, the doing the right thing, alerting early, um, cultural practices that embrace it and the other side of let's keep everything quiet, um, in it, whether it's public, whether it's federal, whether it's state, whether it's private, the bridge is not yet properly um, constructed. I think the engineering might be coming into play on a plan but there's no bridge from one place to the other that people can safely mm. traverse. And can I just make the point that the, the proposed um, federal anti-corruption body was not able to receive reports from whistleblowers. Um, so that there were different flaws in that model um, in terms of how they got that information to investigate to begin with. Yeah. Sounds like we've got some work there to, to happen, yeah. Okay, in the interest of time. Um, okay, so questions. Uh, Jane, this might be one that you can answer. When executive assistants have access to eligible recipients' email boxes, are they deemed eligible recipients? If so, if they view an email first, can they then pass on the information? Uh, look, I'd, I'd, I'd come back to, I suppose, my experience um, in terms of other areas and, and basically previous advice that we had received is that if a person addresses, um, for example, an email to an intended recipient, that that person who they've addressed it to is deemed the recipient. So I would say in that case, it's, uh, the, the, the EA is not an eligible recipient. Um, and in fact, what they are doing in, in reading the email and viewing it first, the breach of confidentiality, um, against the whistleblower. So I think this raises really important practical issues um, about how disclosures can be made, who has access to inboxes. And it may be that people, um, you know, we need to create special mailboxes that perhaps only one person can access um, if they are an eligible recipient in a corporation. Yeah. Um, and, and there's another question here, it's probably an extension to that. When an outsourced electronic whistleblower platform um, is used, who is deemed to be the recipient of the disclosure? If it is the platform itself. So yes. I think, um, yeah, organisations can essentially, um, in their policy, deem certain hotlines, et cetera, to be eligible recipients for the purpose of people making disclosures. 
That's right. Um, we, we, as I said earlier, we run a whistleblowing service. So we, you know, we, we're often used, businesses find some comfort in using us. We protect anonymity. We, we're, that, we're that center line in terms of the protections that a whistleblower has. We're independent. Um, and then we reach into the business as the recipient. Okay. Um, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, before we conclude, I'd just like um, for anyone that's interested in understanding more about whistleblowing, please make sure um, you consider attending the upcoming third Australian National Whistleblowing Symposium to be held virtually on the 11th of November. I would highly recommend it if, if you're interested. Um, and that brings us to the end of this discussion. So thank you, uh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Lewis, for your valued insights. Um, I'm sure you, the listeners, would agree that was a great session. Next month, as I as I said when I opened up, we'll be discussing tone from the top and delving into the board and C-suite responsibilities and the impact of corporate culture on crime and misconduct. This will be an informative look at how boards and management need to address corporate crime. Finally, before we close the session, uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd fill out a short feedback survey that will launch once we close the webinar to help us improve uh, our future webinars. Thank you for joining us today, uh, and I hope you can join us for the next webinar. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you.